Okay, hey everybody, this is Kurt Frankenberg, and uh, I'm broadcasting from Colorado Springs, Colorado, where uh, the weather won't make up its mind. We had uh, 65 degrees one day and a blizzard the next. <laughs> uh, now the roads are clear, but I'm looking at uh, Pike's Peak, and she's still covered with snow. Mike, how's it going up there in uh, Delaware? Uh, we're good, Kurt. Had some great weather over the weekend, and now we're being uh, drenched with spring rain. So it's been pouring uh, since about 8 o'clock this morning. How about that? <laughs> well, uh, besides the season of the year, <clears throat> it, it, it also happens to be uh, earnings season. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think today's today's broadcast is going to be uh, really relevant to people that um, uh, perhaps they are in radioactive positions, or perhaps uh, they're going to decide they want to be in radioactive positions in the future. Uh, with uh, all the things that uh, that earnings season brings, you know, the uncertainty and the uh, the uh, wild moves, you know, up or down. As and, a um, yeah, as a pretext to that, Kurt, we had one of our first questions come in from Paul, and Paul said, oh, "Are there already? certain stock patterns that run the same uh, at times during the year?" And my answer was that, well, you know, over a 12 or 15 month period, there were certain patterns I saw in stocks I traded, usually the larger cap stocks, Kurt, you're talking about things maybe like Hertz Global or Johnson & Johnson last year, there was a specific pattern I could see on that. But yeah. when it comes down to it, the market is rampant chaos, Kurt. We've been teaching and uh, uh, guiding people for that for years now because that's really what it is. And a pattern that emerged, you saw maybe twice uh, over the 12-month period, you know, every six months you saw the same pattern, even three times, you know, every four months you saw the same kind of pattern develop, you're not going to see the same pattern 12 months in the future. You know, the Johnson Johnson, since we exited that trade, I'm just using this as an example because I was familiar with it for 14 months or so, but since I closed the position in January, the movement and adjustments of that stock were completely different than I saw in 2013 to 2014. It's still good, but it's not the same pattern. I couldn't use the same timing I was using beforehand and throw earnings into the mix, Kurt, and, well, flip a coin. You know, no one really knows. <laughs> That's right. You know, if, if earnings disappoint, you know, uh, uh, if, if the stock missed its, missed its earnings by a penny, uh, that, could, that could result in a $10 move down in the stock. And uh, it didn't seem to really make sense, but that's kind of the way it is. So um, the, uh, the whole idea uh, that, that we're going to be sharing today is kind of interesting. We're going to show how to take income on a play without necessarily selling a uh, covered call. <clears throat> and selling a covered call just before earnings is a bad idea, generally speaking, uh, because it does um, cap your upside in case in case the stock moves up, but uh, it also doesn't give you very much protection to the downside. And uh, but we're going to kind of show uh, something that's the reverse of it, and uh, I think folks are going to really, really resonate with this. They're going to really enjoy it. Um, before we get rolling, I'd like to just ask <coughs> who we're speaking with, and um, uh, and just give you a couple of tips for how to get the most out of today's class. Okay, so first of all, um, the 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 way to get most out of today's class. I've got you today, Mike. My goodness, when I don't have you, I really uh, I really appreciate you. Because <laughs> on Thursday I was by my lonesome and wasn't able to handle questions the way that we can. But you know, uh, one of the best things for you to do is pose questions using that question and answer pod. Live questions. You know, this is uh, what is today? It's it's tax day, isn't it? It's uh, April fifteenth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of, the, one of the common questions we get is, hey, is this, is this a recording? No, we, we do all of these things live. And uh, if you uh, have a question for Mike, go ahead and, and uh, type it in. If it's a question for me, uh, Mike will alert me and uh, let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll get her taken care of, okay? Um, another thing to participate is, hey, participate in these polls and these prompts, okay? Uh, these polls are kind of our way of talking with you. You know, with 50-some-odd uh, people on the line, we can't, you know, we can't let the, uh, the sound be on, okay, in case your doorbell rings or your, your wife or your husband wants to talk to you or, or your boss, you know, or whatever. You know, we, we've got to keep the, uh, the microphones muted. But this um, is, is how we can communicate, okay? So let me go ahead and close this. <clears throat> it's been up for a minute and a half. We've got uh, my 28% that are Power Options subscribers. That's marvelous. That means... 72% of the room needs a free link to uh, try out Power Options for free. 
Um, so we'll, we'll make sure you get that. 20%, this is my first radioactive trading webinar. Welcome. I think you're going to enjoy it. 52% uh, have, have uh, been to other radioactive trading webinars and, and back. They're back, you know, so uh, welcome back there, folks. 16% thinking of buying the Blueprint or Home Study Kit. Marvelous. 32% have recently bought the Blueprint or Home Study Kit. So thank you guys for your purchase. And uh, please do use your support. The Blueprint's not just a, a book of pages of ink. Okay, it's it's the support of two offices, the Carl Springs uh, Radioactive Education Office and the uh, Delaware Power Options Office. So, very good. Okay, uh, Mike, let's let's go ahead and uh, dive in here. Okay, I wanted to show. Um, oh well, real quick, here's a caricature of me <laughs> and what our mission is. Our mission is to provide the best options education possible. Okay, to help people stay out of trouble and raise awareness of how the married put strategy combines position sizing and absolute stops but still allows for income. And we're going to share one of the income methods uh, here today. Okay? Uh, we've already asked folks to introduce themselves. We, we saw uh, where they're coming from. Okay? Um, I'm going to make three bold promises. This is what to expect and then we'll just dive in and then we'll just tell you what, you, what you've seen. Okay? First, I'm going to show the solution to a big problem that faces buy and holders today. In fact, I'm willing to bet that you'll take a look back uh, over your trading record and, and wish that you had uh, already been employing it. Okay. Number two, I'm going to show a riskless spread trade, which is done at a credit. Normally, a credit spread anticipates what the market may do, but this one is done after the fact. This is kind of interesting. What's cool about it is that it does not use any short calls at all. And uh, uh, Mike on um, on Thursday last week, I showed uh, income method number six, which which uh, uses a short call, and, and uh, uh, there's management that goes along with it. But today's uh, the the bulletproof vest income method number three doesn't use any short calls at all, and it still leaves the uh, upside completely open. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a really um, exciting prospect. Okay, um, I'm going to show how it's possible to become bulletproof before an earnings announcement or other expected news events. And for folks that uh, are holding stock and, and they're going into earnings season right now, it may not be possible for them to do this move now unless they already set up things the way that I show to set it up. Okay, but you're going to have that knowledge next time around. And for those of you that have picked up the blueprint or have been applying these principles, you may be in a position right now to bulletproof yourself. And so, uh, with no further ado, <laughs> let's uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay. All right. So uh, we already did our baseline. Here's the problem. The problem is an earnings announcement or other expected news item coming up, and this could share uh, send shares either way. All right. So, what if it crashes? Not cool, right? I mean, if if we're long on the stock. And uh, we're coming into the earnings uh, announcement, and those earnings disappoint. Uh, we could get hurt, okay? Mm -hmm. But just as nagging the question is the other side of that, isn't it, Mike? I mean, if we go ahead and sell now, what if it goes up higher? <laughs> what if your stock blows up in a good way, and you get out before the big move? Well, that's no good, right? That's no good at all, okay? So uh, what we're going to do is share the bulletproof vest, which is one of my favorite ways. Uh, Mike, you also appreciate Income Method 4, but this is Income Method 3. It's one of my favorite ways to uh, <coughs> approach an earnings announcement without um, fear. Okay? All right. And uh, oops. everyone's heard this little chestnut of cut your losers short and let your winners run, right? But the problem is few have given the practical instruction of how to accomplish this. And the reverse, my, the reverse of uh, cut your loser short, much of winners run is this structure. What are we looking at? One of two things. So we're looking at a covered call. It's, it's titled, of course, labeled, I should say, up at the top, Kurt. And the yeah. structure of the covered call trade means we're limiting our upside. We've capped our upside gain. So if we buy stock, and we sell a call against it, and the stock pops up 10%, we might make 2 2.5%, two maybe 3% on the position getting assigned without putting more money into the position. 
However, if we only collected 3% on the stock or 3% on the call against the stock position, we're still risking 97% of what we have in stock ownership. Okay, we've hedged our loss by about 3%, but that's it. So if the stock drops 25 or 30%, we're still on the hook for most of that decline. Right. The, uh, the thing is, why does it say bullish here? I've heard people say that, um, and this isn't my propaganda, by the way. I just took this off of uh, the free section of my broker's site. Um, power, uh, not Power Arsons. Um, OX. Options Express. <laughs> yeah, OX, Options Express. Well, uh, why do they see bullish? I mean, uh, I've heard that selling cover calls is a neutral uh, strategy, but is it really? Well, it's it, it's neutral to bullish. It is bullish, Kurt, because the max return is made if the stock moves up. Mm -hmm. It can also be considered neutral because if the stock stagnates, well, maybe your call expires and you can sell a new call against it. But it's not really a bullish strategy because if you're looking for a bullish stock that you're expecting to move up 5 to 10% in the next three to six days, you'll make profit perhaps on a covered call. I should say 30 to 60 days, my apologies. You'll still make a profit on the covered call, but you're going to limit the profit you'd make on a stock that is really bullish. Right. And, and I would say that, uh, that, that you are bullish if you buy stock in the first place. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of foolish to buy a stock that you expect to go down. <laughs> I mean, this, and, and if you're really neutral, you know, why not do a condor or a butterfly? That's, that's a much more profitable trade for the money. Mm -hmm. Well, it says that the risk is safer. Do you agree with that? I mean, that the, the slider being clear over to the left, look, it's one of the safest things you can do. No, do I believe it's that? no, I believe it's slightly safer than owning stock. But what do we think about owning stock? Is that a risky play? I mean, what risk are we taking with just owning a stock outright? And as far as the covered call goes, it's slightly safer than owning stock outright. But I wouldn't consider it a very safe position at all. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that that slider belongs way and heck over to the left. But I will go along with this: that the reward is quite limited. Um, and in contrast, okay, uh, we've got uh, for for example a, a uh, spread trade. Okay, a spread trade does lock in what you could possibly lose. Okay, but it also locks in what you could possibly gain. So that does it uh, follow that rule of? Uh, cut, lose, or short, and let the winners run, or is it also failing? Well, it kind of <laughs> kind of cuts your loser short in the sense, Kurt, that you know the maximum risk going into the position. You know the worst thing that could happen to you on a credit spread when you go into the position. Does it allow winners to run? Well, of course not. You know, if I sold a 50 call and bought a 55 call, Kurt, and maybe collected 50 cents or so, if the stock stays below 50, both calls expire worthless, and I keep the maximum net credit. But if I'm really right on the bearish direction of that stock, and it drops down to $30, $35, $25 per share, I still only make $0.50. Cents. Now, do I consider it safer? Well, it's safer in the sense that you know what your risk is up front. You know your true monetary risk on the position up front. If the stock goes above 55 You've got to pay, you know, five dollars to close the position. You keep the fifty cents. You have a four fifty loss. But I don't consider this a safer strategy so much either. Even though I do know my maximum loss limit, the problem is setting up a vertical spread, as most investors would, looking for the higher probability of eighty or eighty-five percent success rate. You're probably looking to make fifty cents while risking four fifty. So you've got a nine to one or ten to one risk reward ratio. Kurt, do you consider? Yeah, do you consider it a safer portfolio if you have 10 positions open and if you lose, one, you know, take the full loss on one of those positions, it wipes out the rest of the gains in the portfolio? Do you consider that a safer position? Not Trading structure, I should say. <laughs> yeah, it, as far as the structure, no. It, it, uh, it would require me to be right nine times out of ten just to break even. Mm -hmm. you know, and I have to, you know, 90% record is pretty good. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of betting against yourself, I think. Okay. And having said that, I know that a lot of folks online have uh, probably been trading credit spreads. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think you're going to, you're going to see that this is a much more viable alternative. Okay. The protective put strategy is uh, covered in mothballs. Most people don't think about using it. When I say most people, I mean most of the general public. Folks that are professional traders and folks that um, 
manage uh, uh, hedge funds, for example, are very familiar with this technique because it's wonderful. What it does is it, it limits losses but lets winners run. And so if you happen to have a bullish outlook, all right, uh, you would uh, pick up the stock and it, it would be safer. That, that slider does belong clear over to the left, as far to the left as possible. But on the right side, um, with the uh, reward, possible reward, it's unlimited. How high that stock can decide to go up is, you know, it's not limited. And uh, it's not like we've sold a cover call. But what about this thing of income, okay? That's, that's what I want to uh, take a look at right now, okay? So we're going to structure a bulletproof radioactive profit machine. And when I say radioactive profit machine, Mike, what, what do I mean by that exactly? Well, it's a structured trade where we're going to start it off every position, every radioactive profit machine by purchasing stock and purchasing uh -huh. a put option against it to keep our position down to single digits. But at the same time, we're then going to use 11 different adjustments off of that initial setup to generate income, lower the initial at risk, and potentially bulletproof the position. Right. We're going to only share one income method today, uh, but uh, but there are 11. There's 11 different ways to take money out of a an RPM. Okay. And an RPM is a married put position that's put together uh, according to some very specific parameters. Now, I'm going to use this example of research in motion. And the reason I'm going to use this example is that uh, there's a YouTube video out on, well, out on YouTube <laughs> uh, that showed me getting into this position live, okay, and you can check it. Now, these principles have been at work, you know, since, uh, oh gosh, since 2002 when I, when I first invented this play, all right, uh, and uh, it's done very well since then. And this particular position, um, you can go ahead and check up on me on it. It's got about, oh, I think the YouTube video has like uh, 25,000 views or something uh, with, without uh, any kind of promotion, just, just people passing it around. Here's Research in Motion, September 5th, 2007. Now, if I was going to sell a cover call, I did not, but if I was going to sell a cover call, Mike, the, uh, uh, it's September, right, and the October $85 calls are bidding at uh, 610. Now that's that's a pretty huge premium. What does that huge premium tell you? Well, that the implied volatility is increased and the implied volatility is likely increased because there's some events coming up between now and the October expiration. Most likely it's going to be earnings. Uh, could also be anything such as a pending patent, lawsuit, FDA approval, anything of that nature. But what we're looking at here, of course, was an earnings date, if I'm not mistaken. Right, it sure is. And uh, the reason I'm using, one of the reasons that I'm using a dated trade here is that nobody's really looked at research in motion over the last, you know, few, few, few years, okay? Um, and uh, not like they were then. And uh, the thing is, research in motion had a uh, tendency to either spike up or uh, plummet down after an earnings announcement, okay? If I had done a covered call trade and <coughs> if I had gotten, <coughs> pardon me, if I had gotten called out, Okay, if the stock went up and I got called out, why then the profit uh, would have been seven dollars and six cents, or nine uh, percent on the invested dollar amount, the invested dollar amount of uh, seventy-seven ninety-four. Okay, now that's a covered call play. By the way, Mike, would that uh, would that six dollars and ten cents have uh, protected me against the twenty-five percent drop in the stock? Well, no, the twenty-five percent drop here, Kurt, would have been. Uh no, I'm sorry, about 20 points, right? Uh, 21 yeah. points or so. So, okay, so instead of losing 21 points, you lost 15 or 1490, technically. <laughs> right. So that's, uh, uh, that's the risk that I'm facing if I do a covered call play, all right? And, uh, in fact, I've been in uh, research in, mo in motion and made money, and I've been in research in motion and lost money, but I've never lost more than single-digit percent, even though the stock went down by over 30%. Uh, the time that I was in it and, and lost. Well, this isn't what uh, I did, and uh, I will go ahead and show you what I did do, okay? Uh, I did pick up the stock at its current trading price, and then I went out 15 months in time. This is not a typo, okay? Uh, it's 2007, and I'm buying the, the 2009 $100 put option. Now, 
That looks very expensive, doesn't it? Does that put look like it's a big chunk of money? Well, yeah, speaking of 25%, Kurt, you're putting 25% more into the position, aren't you? Yeah. All right. But something that a lot of folks overlook is the fact that I'm guaranteed to get most of it back. You see, the difference between where the stock is now and the $100 strike price is about $16. So about $16 of this 24, I'm guaranteed to get back. I'm mm -hmm. going to definitely get it back. All right. So my total investment is 108.74, but my guaranteed exit because of the put option is $100. So even if the stock goes down to 20 cents a share, which you know it wasn't gonna, but it, but if it if it went down 30 percent, 40 percent, the most I could possibly lose would be single digit percent. Okay, and that's where I set this play up. Okay. Now, fast forward a little bit. Here's what happens. Okay. In three weeks into the position. My uh, put option that had been 2470 in the previous screen was now valued at nine. Whoops, valued at 1980. Okay, can you see everything there? Is is it is my screen showing properly? Good at 1980. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So remember what it was on the previous uh, page. Actually, let me just go back to the previous page. It was 2470. Okay. So when it's gone down to uh, 1980, that's $4.90 loss, right? Yeah, we've lost money. Okay, we have and we haven't, all right, because the, the, the way that I structured this put option, I bought it in the money and far, far away in time. In order for the value to come down by $4.90, the stock had to go up by more than $4.90, okay? Uh, because it's an in the money put option, it's far away in time. If that if that put option is going to lose anything, then the stock has to go up pretty dramatically. Okay, and so what happened was the stock went up. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this play, this this put option, and I'm going to sell it, and simultaneously buy a closer in put option at the same strike price. Now, Mike, if I was to do just this play. What would you call that? I mean, if, if I didn't already own the stock, I didn't already own this put, and I just simultaneously sold this put and bought that put, that would generate a credit, right? Yeah, you'd still get a credit of 1260 but you'd kind of have a reverse calendar spread where the put yeah. option that you sold is uh, a year and two months further out in time than the long option that you bought to cover it. So it would be a reverse calendar spread in a sense. Yeah. And that's and that's kind of hokey and weird. <laughs> Nobody would do this. At least I don't think they would. It's kind of a dumb idea, okay? But um, but because I already owned this put option, okay, what has happened is I've sold this one and bought this one and taken 1260 out of the position, okay? Do I still have a $100 put and do I still have stock? Absolutely, Kurt. You still have a position in place where you're right. insured at the $100 level, and you still have time remaining on the protection, don't you, a month or so. Right, exactly. Now, here's the thing. Because the stock has gone up, this put right here got real cheap. This put right here didn't come down near as fast. And uh, here's here's the, uh, the, what do you call it, the... Um, the sum and substance of what has happened. I've purchased research in motion. I've also purchased a put. And then I made an adjustment to this original investment of 108.74. I made an adjustment that put 1260 into my pocket. I sold mm -hmm. a far put, bought a new put. So now my cost basis on my combined investment is 96.14, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. but, but it's still protected by a put option. It's just a uh, put option that expires sooner. So what is my risk now? I've spent 9614. My put protects me at 100 bucks. What's my risk? Well, your risk is now negative. And what you mean what we mean by negative at risk, Kurt, is that even if the stock fell to one dollar per share, you're still guaranteed to make three dollars and eighty six cents because you're guaranteed Isn't to get out of the position at 100, and you've only got a cost basis of 96.14. So we have no risk to the downside. Isn't that sitting pretty? 
what about the upside? Uh, do I have a short call that's uh, going to cap me if, if the stock decides to go up? Absolutely not. We didn't sell a call to adjust the cost basis of this position. We manipulated the time value of the put options in our favor. And Ooh. so now we still have an unlimited upside profit potential with no risk to the downside. So this is what happened. With no worries as earnings announcement approach, I, I sent an email out to my Fusion subscribers saying, I know the future. And that's a bloody weird thing for me to say, Mike, especially with my reputation. Why would I say I know the future? Because <laughs> never right, you never say that. But what you know now is the fact that no matter what happens at earnings, you're either going to uh -huh. make three dollars and eighty-six cents, or you're going to make much more. Exactly. If the earnings disappointed, I would have made a three and a half percent profit, or three hundred eighty-six dollars, for what I've done up to this point. Okay. And if uh, the stock goes up, well, uh, then we're going to do better. And in fact, that is what happened. And I ended up selling my shares uh, for 114.74. This was a six-week gain of 16.3 percent, and uh, uh, it's a 16.23 percent based on the stock and the put. Okay, not just the stock or not just an option, but the combined cost of both. Uh, the 108.74. Okay. And uh, uh, I ended up making a 16.23% uh, gain mm -hmm. uh, uh, on that play. So kind of cool, okay, really nice. Uh, and uh, if I had sold a covered call, Mike, first of all, it would have been 9%. Secondly, that 9% would have been 9% of a smaller amount, right? That's right. All right. So uh would have felt like a chump there. All right, nine percent is respectable, but it kind of pales next to double digits. Okay, now okay. let's Go before we go any further. We had a question from uh, C. Uh, C asks, "Are you accounting for the four ninety lost on the original put?" Yeah, yeah. We we are counting for it. You don't have to subtract it back out, okay? Because when we showed the original position, the total cost basis was the eighty four oh four plus about the twenty four forty. Okay, so both stock and the original put at 2440, we had a cost basis of about 10880, I believe it was. Okay? It's uh, 10870 was the total cost basis. Right, so that's everything that you have, stock and put into the position. You then yep. sold the put for 1940, so that brings the cost basis down to about, uh, you know, 89 or so, uh, 89 or so dollars. So it's not that we're subtracting 490 out from that. We've already accounted for the total we put in, we subtracted 1260 out, and then added the remainder back in, or the 1260 net credit was a total lower. It sold it for 19, I'm sorry, and then added the new put back in. That was the credit of 12, Kurt. So subtracting that out put the cost basis at the 9614. So you didn't see us <laughs> subtracting out the loss on the put, but it was already accounted for because we did everything as a total cost basis. Right, right. 108.74, I'm looking at the numbers again. 108.74 was the total cost to get into the position, and the uh, uh, profit that I took back out of it was 16.23% of that. All right, uh, did very very well, um, and uh, uh, about $1,800. Okay, and and the thing is, okay, folks, I think you probably want to see that again. Who was it that asked this? Uh, this was C. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He says he's right. got it. Yeah. He says he's got it now, but. You got to figure it out now. Okay, good. So, uh, but not everybody might. So we'll go ahead and show this same uh, income method, but I'll show it with a different stock, and then we'll get into the principle of what makes it work. Okay, so that we really have a, a deep understanding. Okay, so uh, here's what happened long ago, Mike. I got hurt by this covered call uh, trading idea, and uh, the thing is that it. Uh, it kept my upside, and I did make some money a couple of months in a row, but then I made the mistake of following my stock trading guru's advice. He said, you know, if you're going to uh, uh, make, uh, oh, 4 to 6% <coughs> on uh, selling covered calls, you'll make 8 to 10, you know, or 8 to 12 by doing it on margin. I thought, wow, great, I'll do that. <laughs> As you know, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Um, and I got into a position where I got hurt really badly 
But um, afterwards, afterwards, I considered that position and said, you know what? If I had, instead of hedging it by selling a call, if I had hedged that same position by buying a put, it would have been different. In fact, it wasn't an earnings announcement. It was a, uh, it was a uh, FDA announcement. <clears throat> and my stock went uh, plummeted down. It opened at less than half the value of what it had been trading at the day before. I got hurt really badly. But if I had bought a put option that was uh, five, six months out in time, and if I had bought it in the money, okay, instead of uh, selling a call at the money, if I had bought that put in the money, okay, and uh, uh, instead of uh, selling front months calls like you do, you know, to, oh, I don't know, you, you might sell a, uh, a covered call that's a month away for a buck, but a, a covered call that's four months away for two bucks instead of four bucks. You know what I mean? Well, I thought, you know what? Uh, what if I'm going to buy things and, and get it cheaper by the dozen? You know, what? why don't I just buy a put option that's far, far away and uh, pay less per month for the protection? That would be kind of cool. And what that turned into was that turned into trading with a net, okay? Now here's the buy zone of the ATM bell curve, okay? ATM stands for at the money. And whether it's a call or a put, in the money, uh, the time value is low. And out of the money, the time value is low. But at the money, the time value swells up, right? This is a phenomenon that's easily verified. You can go to your options trading tables and you say, okay, now how much of that is time value? If it's an in the money call or an in the money put, you'll see that it's lower than those calls and puts that are trading at the money. Okay? And then out of the money, of course, it's going to be cheaper, whether it's a call or a put. So here's uh, another setup. Here we have Altera at 2735. And uh, I picked up the March, March of the following year, okay? $29 put options. Again, it's in the money and far away in time. That makes for a total invested amount of 3085, but I'm mm -hmm. able to get out at $29. Okay, so my risk is just a difference, or six uh, percent. Now, Mike, uh, why don't I just buy the stock and trade uh, using a um, using a stop order? I mean, that would be the same thing, right? Well, not necessarily. Um, <laughs> stop order is assumed insurance curve. <laughs> Uh, if we have a stop order, maybe we set it to just 6% of our total investment so we could get out at $1.85. That would work for us if the stock gradually comes down to that point and eventually the order gets triggered during the trading day. What ends up getting investors hurt long-term with stop orders, and probably everyone online has had this happen, well, there's actually two things, Kurt. Number one, that scenario I just described happens. You get closed out without your say of the stock at the 6% loss, $1.85 below your cost basis. And then the stock continues to move up. It hits that bottom and then sort of spikes up and just keeps going. So you now miss that boat. And if you want to get back in the position, you have to pay a higher price to get back in. The other scenario is what we kind of described earlier. If I set a 6% stop loss, Kurt, and we've got an event coming up or even an unexpected event happens over the weekend, we wake up in the morning and our stock's down 20 or 25%, we don't get filled at a 6% loss. The stop order was just an order telling our broker to close me out if the stock's ever trading below this. Well, Friday it wasn't. Monday morning it is. We get it closed. We get the worst possible price. We still take that 25% loss on the position. The stop order becomes violated. We get filled at a much worse price, and it didn't really help us. The put option is guaranteed insurance. We're guaranteed that even if the stock fell to $1, we're still going to get $29 back for it. So we're only going to lose that 6%. Here in a minute, <clears throat> I'm going to ask folks, uh, would you have done better last year mm -hmm. if, if you took no losses greater than 6%, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, let me go ahead and share what exactly happened, okay? So in the previous slide, we've got that put option costing uh, $350. Mm -hmm. But as you know, an in-the-money option <clears throat> has two components to its value. It has a time value component and an intrinsic value component. What's what's the intrinsic value mean? Well, for the put in this case, it's the amount of money that the stock or that the put strike is above the current stock price. Um, right. So the intrinsic value is the amount that the option is in the money. 
And so the put that we're using was slightly in the money and had about uh, a dollar sixty five of intrinsic value from twenty seven thirty five to twenty nine. That's a dollar sixty five of intrinsic value. The okay. remaining of the three fifty cost, the dollar eighty five, is the time premium, our extrinsic value, the amount of time we're paying to have this position covered to March expiration. That's right. Okay. Now this was September when I picked up the stock and the put. And what happened was the value of the put went down. <clears throat> but for the value of that put to go down, the stock had to go up a little bit. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, uh, it went up about $2. Okay? Now, with, when there's a dollar and 65 cents of intrinsic value to the put, and that goes away, the only reason intrinsic value goes away is the puts. I'm sorry, is that the stock goes up? Correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what has happened here is the stock has gone up. Is there any net loss for me if the stock goes up by a dollar sixty-five and the put comes down a dollar sixty-five? Is there any net loss for me? Yes or no? No, not at all, Kurt. Because you own both instruments. Right. And in fact, the stock went up by about two dollars. Okay, but still, there was no net loss, and here's why: the extrinsic value, the time value portion, had been a dollar eighty-five, and now it's all time value. Well, hey, uh, if it's all time value, oops, <laughs> <laughs> if it's all time value, what has happened is uh, it's actually increased. It's two dollars and fifty-two cents is where that thing is. Right. All right. So. Um, if I was to simply sell this position, I would make a gain. Here's the deal. Altera shares at 27.35 <clears throat> is where I got in. The put option is uh, uh, 350 cost, so 30.85, the so-called break-even point. Okay. Now, what happened was the stock went up to 29.40. That's still not the break-even point, is it? No, it's still below 30.85. All right. But the fact is, I bought a put option that is way away in time, and I did this for a reason. Not because I expect to hold it for six months, but because of the way that faraway put options behave. You see, that put option is still worth 252. It had been 350. It's worth 252. So it's it's lost 98 cents, but. In order for it to lose $0.98, cents, the stock had to go up by more than $2. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so the combined value, if I sell today, okay, if I sell here on uh, October 15th, right? Right. My my uh, gain would be $1.07, right? Correct. Okay, but that's not what I did. <laughs> I just wanted to display, I just wanted to assure everybody that, hey, uh, even though the put has gone down in value, it doesn't mean that I've lost anything, okay? Uh, because of the way that this was structured. Well, if uh, if I could get 3192 today by selling it, you know, how about I do something different? How about I do this? How about I take that that uh, put that has gone from 350 to 252. The put itself has had a 98 cent loss, but the time value has expanded. The time value was a buck 85. Now it's all time value. And it's 252, and I'm going to take that 252, and because it's at the money, it's $29 put. The stock is trading around $29. I'm going to sell the put, and then I'm going to buy a put that's in the money again. Okay, so this is what has happened. I sell the faraway put option, and I buy a near-term put option that's in the money. And why does this cost less? My, this this near term uh, thirty dollar put option. Why would it cost less than a far term twenty nine put option? What well, has less time? Well, it has less time value on the position. We still have a lot of time value left in the March, um, and uh, the November has shorter ones. All right. So what's happening here is I'm pulling out a ninety cent credit. This is money I can spend today if I want to, and this is per share. I did this on five hundred shares with you know five uh, five put options. Okay, so this was uh, $450, just taken out of the position, just taken off the table. Okay, 
So what remains? Oh, and by the way, we raised the payout. <laughs> Look at that, raised the payout by a dollar. So what remains? What remains is we've got a position where we have a lower cost basis than the put option protecting it. The original was 30.85. Did this play called the bulletproof vest to take out 90 cents. We still have a put option in place. But the cost basis for both the stock and the put option is now twenty nine ninety five, and the put option happens to be a thirty dollar put. So again, Mike, where's my risk? Again, we're at a negative at risk amount, a small negative risk of five cents. Now, even if the stock drops to one dollar per share, we can't lose any money. Exactly. And what did happen uh, at at earnings was the stock uh, blew up. You know, it went up, and uh, I ended up making twelve percent. And and, uh, and we have had the folks say, oh, wait a minute, what about uh, commissions and all that? Okay, okay, let's be real honest. 11.9%. <laughs> I made 11.9% on my money in a seven-week period, and uh, three weeks of those seven could not possibly lose. Kind of cool. What about the first four weeks? I could have lost 6%. Well, guys, think about it. Even if this bulletproofing opportunity never manifested, if, if it never became available, would it still have been a better play if the stock reversed? You know, think about your own trading record over the last 12 months. Okay, and I, I just put up a poll here. Think about what I just showed you. If you cut down your losses from last year from whatever they were to 6% or less per position, would it have been a better trading year? Would you have done better if you had never taken a loss of greater than 6%? Mike, uh, in, in the year that you had a 59.8% gain on one of your stocks, you also had another stock that uh, the stock went down by, by about 50%. What was your loss on that? 4.5%, uh, Kurt. That was Talisman Energy. 4.5% of your capital was lost. Although, if you had just been in the stock without the put, if you had just been in the stock, it would have been 50% loss. That's right. <clears throat> By the way, uh, folks, ladies and gents, that was the biggest loss Mike took that year. <laughs> the biggest loss he took in any position was 4.5% uh, in any radioactive position. Let me go ahead and close this poll. Three, two, one. Okay, so the minority, we did have 5% say, eh, limiting my risk to 6% wouldn't have helped. Okay. Well, uh, oh, can you can you see that, Mike? Am I sharing it properly? That's right. Yes, Kurt. Uh-huh. Okay. 23% said I might have lost, but I would have lost less. 14% lost last year, but would have won if they'd have done that. That's a game changer, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And for some other folks, 45%, I did well last year, but I would have done uh, even better. And finally, another 14% say, uh, I would have been one of those few that was very happy with their trading for last year. Very cool. Okay. Mike, uh, I've got that little blue circle of death going on. I, <laughs> I'm not sure if my, uh, if my uh, poll is showing or my screen. Oh, we've got the what, poll up. I'm seeing the poll, Kurt. Can you shut down the poll? Because it, it doesn't seem to be letting me do it. Okay. Now try to reshow your screen again, Kurt. Huh. Uh, again, it's that blue screen of death here says uh, go to meetings not responding wait for the program to respond I guess okay which one's this did you did you shut down the poll I did yeah hold on one second Kurt sorry my if my screen is up what is showing is is it the fellow that's laughing his way to the bank no 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 Kurt it's the uh, what we're seeing there is oh. the uh, I apologize we're just seeing the open intro uh, for the webinar. One second here, folks. Oh, okay. Well, it's a good thing we showed most of the really pertinent stuff <laughs> already. All right. Uh, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, folks. I'm, okay, give me one second here. It keeps giving me some attitude. Hold on. <laughs> Doing the same thing to me. Hold on. Yeah. says I'm no longer the presenter. That's probably good. Okay. All right. So 
what we should be showing now is just a simple side-by-side -side comparison, which is bulletproof your portfolio. Well, you can tell that we start with the structure of this married put position. Okay, we have a limited risk position, uh, the hockey stick uh -huh. graph you're seeing here, and you know the green is where the profit is, and the red, of course, is the risk. And we're looking at a position where we know what the maximum risk is here uh, at the elbow at the strike price. But we're going to use the different income methods to lower that gap as we generate income or adjust the position or potentially even lower the cost basis. We're going to reduce this at-risk amount here on the position to eventually where we get the point where we can bulletproof the position. Now that's, whoa, hey, that's interesting, Kurt. I wonder where <laughs> that came from. A big yeah, blue screen came up there. Are you seeing that, Kurt? I am. I'm seeing this blue Pac-Man looking thing. Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's got a little, uh, like a mouth on the right side of it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's that's what the, the, the goal is. And we had another question uh, come in earlier, I believe it was from Mateo, who asked, well, how would we approach this in, uh, you know, how would you use this to neutral markets or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, neutral markets or bearish markets? Well, of the 11, yeah, of the 11 yeah. different income methods that we showed, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the 11 different income methods we use in the blueprint, Kurt, some of them are used if the stock moves up in price. Some can be used if the stock stagnates when you first open the Mary put, and some can be used if the stock falls in price as well. Right. right. But we also discuss in the blueprint the full work that describes all 11 income methods, when to use them, and uh, you know the rules to abide by so you don't get yourself in a worse position. Um, in addition to that, Kurt does discuss uh, his approach for maybe opening a position in a bearish market if he thinks the market's moving down, but still keeping limited risk in place and having an unlimited upside profit potential. Yeah, this sort of thing can be set up for a bullish or bearish expectation. Mm -hmm. Side, sideways is how the market sometimes goes, okay, but it's not where you make the most money. Where you make right. the most money is when, when it's directional and you happen to have picked the correct direction. Um, and, and so what we'll do is uh, set up a, a position that if we're bullish, it uh, it has unlimited uh, growth potential. Okay, and if you're bearish, you can also set up a uh, bearish position that's similar, uh, that uh, can can honestly do very very well if the <coughs> if <coughs> pardon me if the market <laughs> crashes. But uh, uh, what's common to both of those is that by using the income method, you can uh, bulletproof yourself. And um, that's kind of what we wanted to show going into earnings announcements. You know, wouldn't it be great to be going into an earnings announcement? And if the expectation is uh, is uh, violated, uh, it doesn't hurt you. But mm -hmm. if your expectation turns out to be all right, well, there's there's uh, you know quite a bit of upside. That's right. And now. Uh... Another comment we had come in uh, from Tan. He says, I guess this explains the VMW position that was done on 4.3. Uh, not really. That was a different manipulation. That was an income method number nine that was done on April 3rd on the VMW position in the Ernie at Power Out portfolio. Um, so that was uh, still taking advantage of the put, but it was done a little bit differently. Um, right. There's ways to take credit from your put that uh, don't involve shortening the time frame. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now we had another call come in real quick. Oh, this is a perfect one. This is a perfect one. We had another call come in or question come in, Kurt. I apologize. And it's from Rob. And Rob wanted to know what about combining with OTM call sales, even greater returns? Well, not necessarily. That is one of right. the income methods. It's income method number one. What you're looking at here is what a limited risk position on Starbucks would be, uh, a protected put position where we've lowered the risk to the downside to 108 you still end up with a capped upside, but when you're doing this from the beginning, you may end up with two ways to lose. Because what starts to happen here, Kurt, is that as the stock moves up, we've sold here, you would have sold the 57 and a half call. That's this strike here. You you have stock, you have a 57 and a half put far out in time, and you sell a near-term 57 and a half call. You do have the potential for a good return, and you do have a good range of profit but you would have entered this position with a bullish sentiment. So if the stock moves up as you expect, you can still give yourselves two ways to lose, okay? Now, this is not 
Income method number one, Kurt, we'll give away a little bit something more for free. Income method number one, you did mention this earlier, is something that you probably wouldn't want to do when you have earnings coming up in a week or so. Right. You probably want to leave the upside open, and if it does go in your desired direction, then you can sell a much higher strike call for a much better premium and be in a better position to probably bulletproof your original RPM. Uh, and, of course, if the stock falls from the earnings, you know you had a limited risk up front to begin with, uh, but you can still do adjustments at that time depending on what your future outlook of the stock is going forward. So that's why coming up to earnings, if it's available, an income method number three and an income method number four would be much better course because you're going to leave the upside open and you're going to lower your risk but trying to force this income method number one can put you in a bad position where you can actually lose more on the upside than you can on the downside because of the obligation of that short call position yeah and, and you'll limit your upside if you happen to be be right about the stock in the first place so it's kind mm -hmm. of trading against yourself um, so uh, essentially in, in answer to the question yeah you could you can take come using calls, but it's not always appropriate to. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mike, I am unable to take the screen back at all. Okay. Uh, I wonder if uh, we made a promise earlier. The promise was uh, that we would uh, send out a free, um, free two weeks of Power Options to everyone that wasn't already a Power Options subscriber. Mm -hmm. I think we have like 28% of the room was power Option subscribers, so that means 72% don't have a subscription. Uh, so, uh, so please, folks, uh, if you trade covered calls, if you trade iron condors or butterflies, or or if you trade radioactively, like what Mike and I are showing you here now, power Option is a set of tools that'll help you number one find those kinds of trades, but number two, uh, be able to see the impact of what your adjustments may be before you do them. And uh, it's an incredibly user-friendly interface, but also very detailed and powerful if, uh, if you want it to be. And Mike is your guy uh, as far as uh, taking it in and making it um, customizable to you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, can you send out the link? I, I can't even uh, seem to get in. To where it's already it's done, out. Kurt. Yep, we already sent out the link there. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. And then the second link, I'd like to give as a bonus to everybody that's viewing today uh, is the, the uh, Iridium bonus. And uh, folks, if you go to radioactivetrading.com, if you're uh, normally going to pick up the blueprint or the home study kits, the blueprint is $339, and it's guaranteed. It has a, a money-back guarantee, so it's there's a riskless trade right there. <laughs> okay, uh, and then the, the uh, home study kit is a little more. It's $599. And that uh, also has a money back guarantee. The difference between the two is that uh, the home study kit also has multimedia uh, lessons instead of strictly uh, print. Both the blueprint and the home study kit come with the support of uh, both the Carl Springs office and the Delaware office. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, Mike, uh, if 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 uh, folks go to radioactivetrade.com, they're not going to see the Iridium bonuses, right? I mean, not normally. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. So we. But uh, if you could send them out that link, uh, guys, there are four bonuses that go along <coughs> with our special Iridium offer here in April. And I uh, highly recommend that you pick that up uh, in order to get all the free stuff. Oops. It goes along with uh, the blueprint in the home study kit. You can keep the free stuff even if you um, return the blueprint. Okay. Um, I had another uh, question come in. I apologize uh, from Giuseppe. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. he says, so even if I'm looking to protect a portfolio with ETF put options, as say, or on SPY or IWM, it's better to go <laughs> further out in time than use the short term. Well... That depends. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, here, here's the general uh, general and all options. You talk to any call seller, credit spread seller, for example, anything of that nature, those doing credit spreads are selling month by month by month or week by week by week. Why? Because they're receiving less premium if I sell week by week by week, but I'll get a much higher annualized return. Okay? If I'm looking right. to sell a covered call that's one month out of time, I might make 3%, but the same strike call, if I'm selling it as a covered call, that's 60 days out of time, 
it's not going to be 6%, it's going to be maybe 4%, 4.2%. All right, you're only getting 1.2%. But the average return, average annualized return, you're always better selling shorter term than going further out in time. You know, sure, the six month yeah. out option, you could sell for maybe three or four dollars. But you know what? It's not six times the cost of the near term option. So option sellers want to sell closer in. Option buyers, the reverse is true. Even if I'm just buying calls, speculating on market movement and using leverage, I want to buy four or five, six months out in time to A, give myself more time for the stock to move in my desired direction, and B, because I am paying a lower cost per day. Okay, it's just like insurance for your car or your house. You know, uh, insurance for your car, you may pay $100 per month. And so if you pay for the total of 12 years on a monthly bill, 12 years, 12 months paying monthly, you'd pay $1,200. Okay, but your insurance company is going to say, hey, you know, we'll throw you a discount. If you want to pay up front six months at a time, we'll only charge you $550 every six months. Well, that makes your total yearly cost $1,100. You've got about $100 in savings. And they'll say, hey, but if you want to pay everything up front right now for the one month or 12 month period, one year period, we'll only charge you $1,000. So now you've got a 20% discount from the monthly. And that's the same thing with options. Those options that are further out in time are more expensive up front, but you're paying less per day for the cost of insurance. Another thing, uh, if, if, if you're going to invest in a put option that's five months, eight months, a year out in time, Mike, do you have to uh, do you have to hold on to it? To Absolutely not. It's something that we control, okay? And if right. we wanted to liquidate the position at any time, we could simply exit both legs. We could sell to close our stock curve. <laughs> we could sell to close the put. We could take the gain, or if the stock just collapsed by 25%, and we don't think it's going to recover, okay, I'll close now for a 4% loss. I was comfortable taking that to begin with. So let me get this off the table, not try to spend another four or five months trying to adjust this position. Let me take that little 4% loss, and I'll invest in something better. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Well, cool. Um, well, Mike, here we are at the top of the hour. Uh, do we have other questions from, from the audience uh, regarding uh, Ink Method 3 or, or, uh, or the reductive profit machine setup? Not right now. I think we've handled them all, Kurt. <laughs> Cool, folks. Uh, here's here's your next step. If uh, uh, if if you are good with the idea of keeping your losses down to six percent or less, regardless of what happens to your stock, uh, but uh, further, you're impressed with the idea of being able to take a credit or become bulletproof without necessarily selling your stock, uh, and being able to uh, take advantage of the continued upside. Why then you'll want to pick up the blueprint. Uh, because the one income method that we showed today, uh, there's 10 others. Mm -hmm. And those 10 others uh, work for different personality types, different expectations uh, in the market, and different conditions for what's happening or has happened in the market. <clears throat> and uh, with 100% money back guarantee, it's, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's, it's uh, easy to, uh, to see why we've been in business for 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know. Like, what... uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say. Okay. I think I know what that is. It's just a um, uh, a transfer thing. It's a uh, uh, a program shift because I think I use Open Office here, and the slides you sent me were the um, from PowerPoint. So I think it's just a glitch in that graphic. That's all that is. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, gang, uh, thanks for joining us all. And uh, Mike, I'll see you again on Thursday. We'll, we'll do a different class. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I wish everybody uh, a happy. Happy Tuesday and uh, and uh, happy trading. All right, everyone. Sorry. Take care, and uh, we'll see you uh, Thursday. Yep. Very good. All right. Talk to you then, Mike. Talk to you, everybody. See you now.